Hi, I'm Ms. Hearn. Let's get started. In this video, we're going to talk about sample spaces, which are really important when we're calculating probabilities. First, we need to understand a few definitions. In the study of probability, any observation or measurement of a random phenomenon is considered an experiment. This is not necessarily the kind of experiment you do in a laboratory. It could just be you're watching something happen. The possible results of the experiment are called outcomes. The set of all possible outcomes is called the sample space. And usually we're interested in some particular subset of the sample space, a collection of possible outcomes that we refer to as an event. So for example, our experiment, the thing that we're watching could just be rolling a six-sided die. The possible results of that experiment the outcomes are things like rolling a five. The set of all possible outcomes or sample space for rolling a six-sided die includes the results or outcomes one, two, three, four, five, and six. And it might be that we're interested in the event that we roll an odd number, which would be the outcomes one, three, and five. Now, if all the outcomes in a sample space are equally likely, as they are in the example of rolling a six-sided die, and if E is an event in that sample space, like rolling an odd number, then the theoretical probability of that event is the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So, for example, the probability of rolling an odd number on a single die. We're going to need to think about the favorable outcomes where we have an odd and the total possibilities in the sample space. In other words, the number of ways to get a 1, a 3, or a 5 and the number of outcomes in the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That's going to be 3 over 6, which we can reduce to 1 half. So the probability of an odd roll on a single die is 1 half. You can see how important the sample space is when we're calculating the probability. So we're going to look at some common scenarios and the sample spaces that we need to calculate their probabilities. Flipping coins, possible genders of siblings, and rolling dice. So let's start with sample spaces for flipping coins. Suppose we're flipping a single coin, then what are all the possible outcomes? Well, we can either get heads or tails. And we're going to assume this is a fair coin, by the way, and that each of those outcomes is equally likely. But what about if we were to flip two coins? So for flipping two coins, we have a method of counting and listing the possible outcomes that we learned in the counting chapter. For the first coin, we can list heads or tails. And then for each of those results, regardless of whether we got heads on the first coin or tails on the first coin, we still can get either heads or tails on the second coin. This means that we can either get heads and heads, heads and tails, tails and heads, or tails and tails. So there are four possible outcomes in the sample space. What about three coins? So for that, we would have to extend this diagram, which by the way is called a tree diagram, to a third coin. Regardless of what we got for the first and second, in each case, we're gonna have two possibilities for the third coin, either heads or tails. So the tree diagram would look like this. Notice that this first branch of the tree diagram covers the case where we have heads, heads, and heads. The second branch covers heads, heads, tails. The third branch heads, tails, heads, and so on. Each branch covers a different scenario, and every scenario is covered. So I'm going to go ahead and list out all the possible outcomes, heads, 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 tails, next to their corresponding branch. And what we see is there are eight branches and eight possible outcomes in the sample space. There's a correlation between the outcomes for flipping two coins and the outcomes for flipping three coins. For flipping two coins, we had one scenario that resulted in the first coin being heads and the second coin being heads. When we look at flipping three coins, there are two times that that happens. Once we have heads, heads with heads at the end, and then the second one we have heads, heads with tails at the end. Same thing for heads, tails in the first and second flips. In two coins, we have only one way that can happen, but when we add a third coin, we now go to heads, tails with heads or heads, tails with tails. So you see how we got double the number of outcomes when we have three coins versus two. So let's look at how we would use this sample space for three flips. We can find, for example, the probability of exactly one tail in three flips. 
Where do we see one tail? Well, there's heads, heads, tail, heads, tails, head. And then over here we have tails, heads, heads. Those are the only three outcomes that have exactly one tail in them. So there are three favorable outcomes out of the eight possibilities in the whole sample space. Now notice that when we found the sample space for a single coin, there were two outcomes. For two coins, there were four outcomes. For three coins, there were two two times two times two equals eight outcomes. Each time we doubled the number of outcomes from the previous number of coins. That pattern would continue. If there were four coins, we'd have two times two times two times two equals 16 outcomes. In general, there are two to the n power ways to flip n coins. So if you wanted to know how many different possible results you could get for flipping, say, 100 coins, you could raise two to the hundredth power. Next, we're going to switch gears and talk about genders of siblings. If you assume that there are two genders, male and female, boy and girl, and you wanted to simulate birth orders, you could actually use coins to do it. If you flipped a single coin, you could think of heads as being boys and tails as being girls, and replacing heads with B for boy and tails with G for girl, you'd get the possible outcomes in the sample space for the genders of a single child. The child could be a boy, or a girl. Similarly, instead of thinking of flipping two coins, we can replace each H with a B and each T with a G, and we get all the possibilities for the genders of two children. Boy, 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 girl, girl, boy, or girl, girl. And you can do the same thing for three coins, changing it to the scenario of genders of three children. So we know we have eight outcomes there, just as we did for three coins. For example, we could find the probability of exactly three boys when we have three kids. That only happens in one place. That's that first outcome in, that we've listed in our sample space. So that's one out of eight. One eighth is the probability. Once again, for one child, there were two possible outcomes in the sample space. For two children, two times two or four. And for three, two times two times two equals eight. Each time the number of possibilities doubled. So in general, there are two to the end gender possibilities for n siblings. Each time you work a problem that's related to birth orders of children, you're going to use this idea. Now let's go back to the dice example. Let's suppose that we're rolling a six-sided die. We already talked about the sample space for a single fair die, one, two, three, four, five, and six. But what if we were rolling two dice? For two dice, the easiest way to list all the outcomes, making sure you don't list anything twice and you don't miss anything is to make what's called a product table. This product table is going to represent a scenario where we have one red die and the possible results for rolling a green die. And so if we could fill in the first row with all the results that occur where the red die has a one showing. So you could have one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, and one, six. Or if the red die were a 2, 2 with a 1, 2 with a 2, 2 with a 3, 2 with a 4, 2 with a 5, or 2 with a 6 on the green die. And you could continue in this way. This is a complete list of all the possible outcomes of rolling two fair dice. This is a 6 by 6 table, so there are 6 times 6 or 36 possible outcomes. We can use this table anytime we have to find a probability related to rolling two dice. So if I asked you to find the probability of rolling at least one three when you roll two dice, refer to the table so that you don't undercount or overcount. On the table, where do we see rolls that have threes in them? Well, there's the row and column that contain threes. Each one of these rolls or outcomes has at least one three in it. And if you count them, make sure not to count that double three twice. It only occurs once, so we're going to have 11 different possible outcomes where we have at least one three out of the 36 total possibilities. So that probability would be 11 over 36. What if we wanted to think about rolling three fair dice? That would be a lot of possible outcomes. That would be difficult to list them all. And in general, in our class, uh, for my students, we only usually stick to two dice in the probability problems. But let's just say we needed to know how many 
were in the sample space for rolling three fair dice. We know that for one die, there were six possible outcomes. And for two dice, there are six times six equals 36. And if you guess that for rolling three fair dice, there were six times six times six possible ways, you would be correct. Each time you increase the number of dice by one, you multiply the number of possible outcomes by six. In other words, there are six to the n possible rolls for n dice. So we've covered the sample spaces for flipping coins, genders of siblings, and rolling dice. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please remember to like it. You can also subscribe to my channel, Miss Learn Mathematics, for more math videos.